All right, hi. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about three different kind of theoretical perspectives about what stratification and social class is. Uh, and so I'll be talking to you about Karl Marx, uh, Max Weber, and then uh, Pierre Bourdieu, this French theorist, the French sociologist. And so I've talked about Marx quite a bit in class. Again, just to remind you, it's not necessarily that I'm a Marxist sociologist. I'm not one by any means. Um, but he really represents uh, as, as a very good kind of typology of conflict theory, uh, where there's strong differences between classes. And so he's useful to present for that reason. So basically, uh, um, Karl Marx's essential argument is that social relations depend on who controls the primary mode of production. So in any given epoch, any historical epoch, you should look at how people are producing their economic uh, kind of life, their social life through the economy. And so there might have been an agrarian economy, there might have been a petite bourgeois economy where people are making small crafts in their villages, but he was particularly studying the Industrial Revolution. So he was looking at capitalism as an economic mode of production. And so according to him, capitalism is an economic system in which private individuals control the means of production and the main incentive for economic activity is the accumulation of profits. So uh, capitalism, the, there are people who own the factories, own the machinery, own enough wealth that they can hire people to work. And so from his point of view, from a large part of his research, not all his entire career, for much of his writing career, he talked primarily about two main classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And so the bourgeoisie are the capitalist class. They're the ones who own the means of production, own the factories and have accumulated wealth uh, that they can hire labor. And then the proletariat, who's the working class, and they're the exploited class by the capitalists. They have nothing at all to own. They only have their bodies. They can sell their labors to the capitalists. And so from the bourgeoisie's point of view, Karl Marx argued uh, that the, the bourgeoisie had a simple goal. And he talked about it in his what he called his labor theory of surplus value. And so he says that the goal of bourgeoisie is to never pay workers the value of what they create. Never, ever pay workers the value of what they create take the surplus, the profit of paying people less than the value of what they create and use that as profit for yourself and that you should try to have a downward pressure on wages at all times and that this was unrelenting so that capitalists were always looking for ways to get more product made by paying and paying people less. So how can you get people to make more things and get paid for less for each item made? And this is like a competition among capitalists to make that happen. And so the focus is on profit maximization and not worker or larger societal well-being. And in some of his writings about this, he talks about how um, it's a really kind of a vicious competition across capitalists to make this happen. And so how does this play out in the behavior of the bourgeoisie, according to him? He says that uh, the bourgeoisie will use any means at all to try to reduce the cost of labor. And so one way they can reduce the cost of labor is getting rid of labors entirely so you can mechanize. You can uh, get um, machinery and or artificial intelligence or robots or computers to do human work. The other thing is that you can de-skill. That's often called tailorization after the person who kind of invented it. And tailorization involved uh, people coming into factories and watching what does it take to make a product and then simplifying each motion. So if it takes, you know, how much labor does it take to put a nugget on a, a tire? And so if you can figure out how you can kind of de-skill it or maybe have a machine do it, or break it down into such a simple movement that uh, you can just get a lot more done per unit. That's kind of like the de-skilling, that you're taking someone's work that they might have considered to be an apprentice or a craft, and you're de-skilling it so that you can pay them less as a de-skilled laborer, a low-skilled laborer. And then the other one is that you can pit proletariat people against each other. And so you can tell people, hey, if you don't like the wages that we're paying you, don't strike. It doesn't matter to us. We'll just fire you and we'll hire the reserve army of labor. We'll hire these people who are willing to work for less. Or if you don't like it, we'll just take our factories overseas and uh, have people in another country do the labor. And so there's this kind of like trying to uh, get people to agree to lower wages. And so the other argument is that they might try to mollify or sort of trick the proletariat. And so there's a dominant ideology or attitude that the bourgeoisie would say and so that is the set of cultural beliefs and practices that helps maintain the status quo. So, for example, a really harsh example is if you've ever read uh, the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx goes that religion is the opiate of the masses. And what he means by that is that religion is telling people don't worry about the uh, terrible things that happen to you on earth, that there will be a heavenly reward. And so 
don't focus on I'm not having um, material equality here you'll receive your riches in heaven and he argues that's a way to pacify people to accept extreme exploitation so uh, he argues that what happens here is that uh, the, the proletariat has to have kind of an orientation to this and so basically what he says is that uh, at first capitalism seems pretty good to everyone it's starting to eliminate the scarcity of needs there's enough food going around uh, and so the proletariat's willing to kind of consider that maybe they, their interests are aligned with the capitalists. <laughs> and so he argues that that's false consciousness. When you're aligning yourselves with your oppressors, you are kind of like having this false consciousness. And so what he argues is that you're going to develop a class consciousness, which is a subjective awareness of your common interests and the need for political action to bring about a change or a revolution. And so what he says is that... Um, what happens is that the capitalists, um, he has this really kind of dramatic word for it. He talks about it. They put the um, nail in their own coffin. The bourgeoisie puts the nails in their own coffin. And how they do that is in order to be more efficient and make more profit, they bring all the workers together in factories. And so all of these people that get are together. And when they begin to feel exploited and mistreated, they turn to their left and they turn to their right and they realize other people are being exploited just like them. And so it makes them more conscious and, and revolutionary and more willing to overthrow the, the bourgeoisie. So there's a model. And you can see very much that this is high conflict model between the capitalists, the haves, and the have-nots. And his model, his theoretical model, is essentially an economic one, right? And so remember that I told you that uh, Max Weber, he argued that, hey, there's some things I do like about Karl Marx. I do like to see uh, this notion about how important the economy is and about how there might be conflicts about inequalities and how people are treated within the economy. But he doesn't think that class is the only thing that uh, sets someone's position in a stratification system. And so he thinks there's this three distinct components. One is class. Uh, that's your level of wealth and income. Another is status. People have the same prestige or lifestyle. And then the last is party. And that party is not like whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or independent. It's basically your capacity to organize to accomplish some particular goal. So are you particularly efficacious in your community? Can you organize well with others to improve your circumstances? Or are there barriers that make it so that you're unable to get your goals met, your political goals or social goals? I think this is sort of interesting. I especially like the status group ideas because he's trying to talk about how uh, given a certain amount of wealth, people do live in different ways. So for example, I would consider myself to be middle to upper middle class uh, and I... Uh, uh, my lifestyle is one that's around horses, right? I have really two beautiful horses and I have beautiful tack and I take riding lessons and I go to shows. And so you really kind of see the lifestyle that I'm having, right? The prestige that I'm having. My aunt is the same sort of thing. She didn't get a PhD, but she worked really hard her whole life uh, at Sears uh, and at uh, uh, different stores as a real clerk. And she took every overtime she could have. And so and she married a man who worked at Chrysler and he never uh, said no to a shift for overtime. And so they became very upper middle class as well. But they like to display their wealth through traveling. They like to travel a lot. And so they travel uh, on a lot of guided tours and that sort of thing. And so we're living very different lifestyles, even though we're in the same class, right? Uh, and that if I'm likely to be dating, I usually date somebody who I've met through the horse world, right? Uh, and they have all these friendships that they develop through travels through the world. So, for example, some people might want to put their money into buying a nice car, while other people might like to put their money into going to lots of, lots of rock concerts. So status, I think, is a really interesting thing to study. So that leads us to the last one, Pierre Bourdieu. And so Pierre Bourdieu, he's really interested in cultural capital. And so you may remember way at the start of the semester, and some of you may be writing about it for your final exam, but I had you read an article by a, a sociologist who was using his ideas about cultural capital. You remember that Annette Leroux piece that was talking about how working class people may have less cultural capital to navigate universities than people from the upper middle class because people from the working class may feel less entitled. They don't know the rules of the game. They don't know that they're allowed to ask professors to make uh, exceptions or to give extra credit. And so Bordeaux is talking about this cultural capital. And so basically cultural capital is our tastes, knowledge, language and ways of thinking that we exchange in interaction with others and that because culture is hierarchically valued it can be a form of power and it's argued that people in different classes have different kinds of cultural capital i've talked about this before in school uh, in class so for example uh 
I may not, if I ever met uh, a really wealthy person in New York City, I may not know what's the best uh, fraternity to belong to at Harvard. But if I lived here in town, I definitely know who's the person to talk to if I want to get my kid into 4-H club, right? That my form of cultural capital might suit me really well here, but it might not be useful elsewhere, right? And so basically, cultural capital can be used as a form of exclusion. And that you can pass down cultural capital just like you can material capital, like economic capital. So for example, uh, George Bush, he's a legacy uh, at an Ivy League college. Uh, and so you're able to kind of bequeath your cultural capital. And so Bourdieu argued that, hey, you know, there's three kinds of resources that are useful to people. Material resources, their economic resources that they own or the control, social resources, the prestige based on the occupation, the position they have, uh, their, their social network connections. So like, do you know people that can help you if you need help? And then their cultural resources, their taste, language, and way of looking at the world. And that people are making kind of different exchanges based on that. So I might use my material resources, spend money to get a college degree to improve my social resources. Uh, I might uh, use my good education, my cultural resource, to get a good job to get me material resources. And so he really considers these kind of three forms of resources to be really fungible, to be really exchangeable. And so basically cultural capital the, the, uh, is this uh, how our, our cultural tastes tie us to social and material resources. And that our preferences in life are shaped by our social positions. So, you know, my parents really focused on wanting me to get an education, focused on trying to tell me the importance of it. Uh, they really moved upwardly mobile because of education. And so my preferences are shaped by that. My parents have taught me to really value being a person who likes book learning and likes new ideas and likes to reach out and talk with people. So that's a preference that's been ingrained in me, right? Uh, and that entitlement itself is tied to culture and our social positions. So on the human family development side, there's a lot of research that shows that, uh, you know, that we are socializing children differently based on class. So that by example, by, by age three, children with professional parents have 500,000 instances of praise and only 80,000 words of disapproval. But children in families on welfare are praised only 75,000 times and are reprimanded 200,000 times. And so you see these real class-based differences in kind of how even children are raised. And so I think that's sort of interesting to think through how our social resources, material resources, and cultural resources shape our behaviors in the world.